All right, YouTube, uh, here's part two of our little parkerizing uh, video. Today I will try to cover each step uh, in relative detail as much as I can. Here's a couple of the guns that I was talking about. As you can see, there's uh, just a ridiculous amount of surface rust. Um, I believe what happened uh, was that these guns were basically in a fire, but the fire didn't exactly burn the stocks or anything, but I, I think uh, when it ended up happening was I guess they got wet somehow, whether rain leaked through the roof at some point, or maybe these guns stayed on the premises after uh, the fire department put the fire out, you know, from the water hoses. But either way, this is what we got to contend with. You can see here that the uh, finishes on these guns are just in horrible shape. We're going to try to fix that, but we're going to go from this rusty pitted finish you see here to a nice black manganese phosphate. Uh, also known as parkerizing. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Okay, the first thing that we've done here is uh, we've disassembled the firearms that we're going to parkerize. Uh, right here we've got a Japanese Arasaka. Unfortunately, I know what you guys are thinking. But we've got some pretty bad rust here on the receiver. I mean, this thing has seen better days. You can see where the stock meets the barrel where, you know, of course the barrel was protected a little bit, but then you've got just a huge rust bucket here on the front. What we're going to do first is we've got an ultrasonic unit set up here. Right there. It's got temperature control and everything like that. What we're going to do is we're going to use simple green and we're going to use some distilled water. We're going to put it in a little mixture, just a basic mixture. We're going to get it up to temperature and what we do is we run all this through the ultrasonic and what that does is it cleans off any residual oil, dirt, rust flakes, I mean just whatever we can get off the metal. For one thing, you don't want to you don't want to contaminate your blasting media with oil particles or anything like that. After the point that this metal is cleaned, we're going to handle this with gloves because we don't want to transfer any oils from our hands to the metal you get fingerprints, splotches, and in general it just look like crap. So we're going to go ahead and get this stuff degreased and cleaned up and then we're going to go out to uh, we're going to go on to blast. Alright so this uh, ultrasonic cleaner has a basket in it for small parts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, items like our trigger guard, floor plate, see all the rest. We're going to dunk it in here all of our small parts. We got a bayonet here. We're going to go ahead and parkerize this thing. Toss it in there. Basically any small part. Alright, we're going to give that a dunk. We're going to take the barrel to action itself and what I'm going to do is I'm going to dunk one end of it in the ultrasonic at a time to where we're going to go about half a cycle with one end and then half a cycle with the other end. Uh, all the while we're trying to concentrate on the heavy, uh, the heaviest rusted parts. So I'm going to go ahead and dunk the muzzle first because that's really rusty. All right. So basically now, all we're going to do is let this ultrasonic uh, do the work. And we're going to pull out the parts and scrub them down with just a little basic uh, cleaning brush, nylon bristle cleaning brush. All the while, especially uh, when we get near the uh, end of the stage where we're going to take this thing out and blow it off with an air, air nozzle to get all the excess water off before it goes into the... Uh, blasting chamber. Always make sure you're wearing gloves so you don't transfer any oils. 90% um, of the finish you're going to get on a firearm is always going to uh, directly equate to the quality of the prep work you do on the metal. Alright, so let's keep going. Uh, while we're waiting on the uh, parts in the ultrasonic, uh, I know this isn't really related to parkerizing, but I wanted to show this stock. Um, this is a stock for our Arasaka that we're working on. I mean, it's it's kind of dirty, you know. You can see that it's it's definitely uh, seen some, uh, you know, carbon and everything getting into the uh, pores of the wood just uh, due to the, uh, I guess, the ashes and the smoldering and you know the bit of fire that it saw. Um, but the stock itself did not catch fire, so believe it or not, this stock looks pretty rough. But when we're done with it, it's uh, definitely going to clean up very nicely. All right. Uh, I'm going to show you a uh, Winchester Model 70 stock. 
that um, Ray has already gone through and cleaned up and uh, you'll see the difference. Uh, the Model 70 stock looked a lot like this Arasaka stock so let me go get that and we'll show you what this is going to look like when it's done. Okay, this Model 70 stock was subjected to the same exact abuse as the Arasaka. They were stored in the exact same place and this is what just a little bit of basic cleaning can get you even on a stock that has seen much better days. Um, this stock was not refinished. This was just cleaned up and just a basic coat of tongue oil was put on the stock and then sheened over with steel wool. Just a little bit to protect it. So, you know, just to give you an idea while we're waiting, this is the kind of stuff we're looking to do is restore these guns uh, without ruining too much of the uh, overall value, more so than it, it already has been done. But anyway, let's get back to the metal. All right, we've gotten our small parts uh, cleaned up in the ultrasonic with a little bit of simple green. Uh, you can also use any other uh, type of industrial cleaner like uh, Purple Power, etc. We're going to go ahead and turn our tank on, our uh, propane tank. And we're going to light these burners because we want to go ahead and start getting our solutions up to temperature. The manner in which you bring these solutions up to temperature is uh, actually pretty important. You don't want to um, heat them up too quick or else you're going to get a lot of scorching. You're going to get rapid evaporation of the water and you're going to have to constantly uh, be monitoring the temperature and water levels as they pertain to the mixture of the manganese phosphate levels. Um, when you buy the solutions that come in these gallon jugs and get uh, stuff like this from Lauer Custom Weaponry and other uh, places, but well, what you'll do is you'll mix a gallon of the manganese phosphate solution to four gallons of distilled water. If you don't have access to distilled water, you can use rainwater that's been decanted, filtered. Uh, it actually works very well. And some people even report that the decanted uh, rainwater works better than distilled water. If you don't have either of those, you can use tap water, um, but your solutions aren't going to last really as long. and. Uh, you're not going to get as uh, brilliant of a black color for as long with each subsequent uh, application of the solution to each item. So basically you won't be able to park uh, quite as many items. I have here a water bath and all it is is just uh, pure clean water and that's to neutralize the solution once the parkerizing process has taken place. We move over to the water bath and go ahead and neutralize the solution and then we go on to blow it off to remove all the water and then oil it up. So I'm going to go ahead and bring these uh, solutions up to temperature. We're looking for a temperature range of around 195 to 210 degrees. You want to keep it uh, within those you know, temperature ranges. Uh, you could go as low as probably 185 degrees, but in my experience it doesn't produce uh, quite as brilliant of a finish. Uh, what we have here is just a little candy thermometer to uh, monitor our temperature. So we're going to place that in here and I'm going to go ahead and get these burners going. Uh, there is one thing that I failed to mention. I uh, went ahead and got the burners lit. We got them set very low because we want to bring the temperature of the solution up as slow as possible so we don't scorch the solution and get rapid evaporation. Part of that, uh, part of what aids in that process is these aluminum plates that I have here and basically they're intended to work as a heat sink to disperse the heat properly and to draw away excessive heat from the eyes themselves and that helps to uh, even out the uh, the heat as a whole to these tanks you can also go with something like a cover like I have here to prevent the water from evaporating quite as quickly well it'll evaporate but it'll just gather on the surface of the cover and just fall back in there that's not a problem, but bear in mind that if you're going to do that, that it will raise your temperature a considerable amount. You do not want these solutions to boil at all. If it's boiling, it's going to be pretty much useless in terms of your usable time frame. You're going to have to use it before the water evaporates. You're going to lose a lot of water. So I'm going to allow these solutions to come to temperature slowly but surely. And uh, I'm probably going to go on and blast a few parts here. Still waiting for our uh, solutions to come up temperature. So what I thought I'd do is uh, talk about containment. And basically, uh, we have these small rigs that uh, one of the gunsmiths here at the shop uh, built that he's been parkerizing with for several years. And we have some basic brackets and things that he's made out of uh, black iron wire. 
Um, you know, basically you can make yourself small things like this, where like with this thing you can lay parts across and then be able to pick them up out of the solution. The name of the game is uh, reducing the amount of contact that you have with each part individually, both with tools and especially with your hands. I mean, the less you can move it, the better. So you have these small baskets like these, where you just have some basic wires, a mesh basket, you dunk your small parts in here, put them down in the solution, let them etch a bit, shake them around, make sure they etch on all sides, and you're good to go. And this is something where it's very self-contained, very easy to use. So we have a few of these small baskets we're going to be using. Um, also, he built some small hangers to put on the sides of the tank here to hang your barrels on. Uh, you put your barreled actions on here, and these small notches sit in the edge of the tank. And basically, with the way this wire is put together, uh, you won't have to move the barrel actions very much to get etching where it's coming in contact with this, just because there is such a small surface area coming in contact with this wire. So little deals like these are real handy to have. All right, then you have your other type of arrangements where he built one that hangs on the side of the tank like this, but then it's got these small little hooks that poke out here, and you can put hang small parts on these. So basically the sky's the limit in terms of your imagination and what, what you're needing to do and what you need to come up with. You know, basically we got the same exact arrangement here, but just a smaller one. And he took the wire and bent it and made some little arms, and then you have a bend in the wire where it hangs on the side of the tank. So we're going to make extensive use of these. All right, while we're waiting on the uh, solutions to come up to temperature, I'm going to talk about a little bit more of the equipment. And you're probably wondering, well, why don't you just get to work and stop talking and all that? Well, the reason I'm trying to cover this stuff now is because once you get started in this process, you really can't stop for very long. Because from the moment you remove this finish from the metal to the point that you're blowing the you know, excess uh, blasting media off, doing either your, uh, your pre-dip, uh, war uh, warming pre-dip, and then going on to your parking, uh, it's a process that you really can't stop. So make sure that once you uh, get into this that you, you don't have your cell phone on or people bothering you or little kids running around. Um, <clears throat> basically, we've got a homemade cabinet here that Ray made. He's got his gloves in here. Um, the solution that he's using, or the media, I should say, it is a, a sil uh, like a, a ground glass and sand silica compound like they use in uh, automotive industry to blast parts. So that's what we're using here. He's just got his uh, basic blasting nozzle set up with the airline running over here to a uh, Husky 60-gallon uh, air compressor here, 6.5 horsepower. Uh, that's what we've got running the blasting media itself. As far as the grate in here, he's just got a uh, you know piece of just industrial grating down on the bottom, and it's nice because it provides enough air, uh, space for the sand to get back down in there. Yet yeah, you can put fairly small parts in here. He's got just some uh, basic industrial type latches here to hold the door in place. He's got a vacuum hose hooked up to it and it's pretty cut and dry. That keeps it where you can see what you're doing you know, fairly easy. He's got his vacuum cleaner up there. There's his uh, compressor. And I've also got another compressor set up over there. And that's the one that we're going to use to blast off uh, parts with air. And there are um, both oil and water filters in both the lines of these compressors. Make sure you have those because you don't want any uh, residual oil or air from the lines, or water rather, from the lines to get onto your uh, freshly pre prepared part. And remember that uh, a large part of the uh, quality that you're going to get out of your work is going to come from the metal prep. So I think we've talked about everything for the most part. I'm going to get started and I'm probably not going to narrate a whole lot because there's going to be a lot of noise going on, but hopefully you'll get a, a glimpse of how this process works. It's pretty interesting. Okay, I'm having to work quickly here. I went ahead and uh, blasted off the shotgun barrel, and we've gone ahead and blasted it off really well and gotten all the you know excess uh, blast media off of it. We're going to take our small uh, hooks that we saw earlier here, and we're just going to arrange them as such here, and we're going to drop this bad boy in here.
All right, we got our barrel in the park tank. I'm going to move the camera in close to show you what it looks like. I want you guys to bear in mind that this process is kind of difficult to film and perform at the same time. So I'm probably leaving out a few details here and there. I don't have a cameraman. I'm doing the best I can with what I've got. But right now, this barrel is in here etching. And we're just going to sort of rotate it just a little bit just to make sure that all the areas are getting covered real well. This little rig works great. All right, we've been allowing this process to occur now for probably about eight minutes. Depending on the temperature we run the solution at and how old your chemicals are and oftentimes the metallurgy of the actual material you're parkerizing, It'll take anywhere from as little as six to eight minutes to as long as often 15 to even 20 minutes depending on you know all those factors but basically when it stops etching it's done so we're just going to allow this to uh, work into the metal and etch it and basically what the parkerizing does is it etches the very surface of the metal it actually removes a very small area of the surface metal and you're left with a black color, black finish that soaks up oil really well. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to go from the part tank once it stops etching. We're going to dip it in our water tank and then we're going to treat it with oil and let it sit for a day or two and this thing's ready to go. Now you see the starchy buildup that's in the tank? That's coming from the fact that we got just a little bit of excess heat going on there and it's causing that you know, slight starchy buildup you see there. That's not a problem. Uh, when you go to um, reclaim your solutions from the tank, that'll be decanted off, not a problem. Okay, I kind of had to work fast with that last piece I was doing. But basically all you do is you let it finish etching, dip it in the water bath to neutralize the solutions or neutralize the process on the metal. Go ahead and blow it off, make sure it's dry, and then follow up with a good coat of oil. Uh, the way the surface looks, this ballastol, it kind of forms a sort of a grease on there. That's normal, but that's our nice uh, new black finish. There's the receiver that goes with it. The lighting is not all that great. You can't see that well, but the colors match up fairly decent. Um, now that piece there, the magazine extension, it's going to have to be polished and blued separate because of the nature of the way that particular uh, firearm operates. It has a gas seal and if you parkerize it, you remove too much of the uh, tolerances and it really won't run that great. I'll show finished product at a later date, but that's the Winchester Model 70 uh, barrel receiver that we did a few weeks ago. And there's another 1100 barrel that I did. So all these parkerizing jobs have been turning out real nice. Um, and that's pretty much how to do it in a nutshell. I know I couldn't really cover every little thing exactly to a T just because the nature of this work you do kind of have to stay on top of it. But that's pretty much at least a little bit of each process in a nutshell.